Well, good morning, everybody. Let's have a stretch. How are we doing? Sam here, United People's TV. We're here to talk about David De Gea agreeing a new deal at Manchester United. Mike McGrath from Telegraph reporting the news last night. We are going to discuss it as a community this morning. I think I said yesterday, uh, was it the day before, uh, that I, I sort of I said we would park the De Gea conversation until real genuine developments happened. And I didn't actually expect they were going to happen within 24 hours, but here we are. So I'm going to run through the full uh, report from Mark McGrath uh, on De Gea's new deal. The terms, uh, there's no confirmation on the wages. There's no actual confirmation on the um, length of that contract. But in terms of De Gea not getting guarantees, he's going to be number one. The structure of his weight, I'll run through the full details with you this morning as a community, just like we do Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. every single week. We're going to speak about Dean Henderson. We're going to speak about Manchester United's creators, not just Bruno Fernandes, but there's some interesting data that I stumbled across on Reddit this morning. I want to bring it to you. We're going to speak about it. We'll speak about the latest frustrations on the takeover. I did my video yesterday, uh, what I considered to be a pretty fair and balanced um, objective look at all the pros and cons of Ineos and the 92 Foundation. We'll speak about that. We'll speak about there was a pretty cool interview with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer speaking about Carrick and McKenna. And you can ask me your questions like you do every single day. Make sure you drop a like on the video. Uh, make sure you send in your comments, your questions, your super chats. Who's down from the community? So look, um, <laughs> 10 a.m. ish, 10 a.m. on the button, on the button. Uh, Charlie, good morning to you. Uh, I can see you there. We've got uh, Chris. We've got Shegzy. Spence92, how you doing, buddy? We've got Dylan G. Uh, and you're there as well, Carl, Matt Bird, Nathan Hawking. Uh, we've got Bully, we've got Alex. Good morning to you. We've got Paula. Who's that? Just joining as a member there. We've got Adam James joining as a new member. Good morning to you, Adam. Look at that. Big up to you, my son. Let me know where you're watching. Big up to you, my son, as if I just said that. Uh, Nick, you're watching on Facebook. Matt Frost, how you doing, buddy? Ian Cartwright, and plenty more of you. Josh, you're there too, as always. Let's speak about this, right? I've made my opinion clear on De Gea. This isn't going to be a video where I sort of, I get angry and sort of slag the club off. I'm not particularly happy with it. I'm going to run through it and then I'm going to discuss it with you as a community. All right, let's see what this is saying. David De Gea has agreed the terms. I'm going to go full, more full screen on this. Don't need my face here. David De Gea, oh, one second there. That was nearly bad. Go over here. There. David De Gea has agreed the terms of his new contract at Manchester United to stay beyond the present season. The framework of the deal with a lower basic salary and incentives for matches played and performances of competitions has been negotiated and is waiting to be signed off by United before an announcement is made. So De Gea has agreed on those terms. And we're just waiting for the announcement. We're waiting for it to be completely signed and for the announcement to come. Now, that framework of the deal is quite an interesting one because if Manchester United just wanted De Gea to stay for another season, they could have just renewed his contract by one more year. But that would have been De Gea staying on 375 grand a week. Mm -mm. Hell no. So Man United have negotiated a new set of terms. Now, everything that we've seen and heard around what the, the numbers would be, the last I've read, and I, again, I don't know how accurate this is, was that De Gea rejected terms around about, of around about £200,000 a week. You, don't, you can do the maths. That's just about nearly half of what his previous contract, current contract is. I like the idea of it being a much lower basic salary with incentives for matches played. Because as you can see from the from the type from the headline here, there are no guarantees that De Gea is going to be number one. And that's an important part of this. Let me pull the chat up here so I don't miss anything because I can see. Everyone's getting a bit gongy down in the comments. Gongy. <laughs> Is that a thing? I would have made a word up. Nathan Hawkin. Hey, Nathan Hawkin, sorry. And Alan, how you doing, guys? Both of you generously gifting five memberships. Legends. 
Ah, oh, just missed the gong. <laughs> just missed the gong. <laughs> what an idiot. What an absolute idiot. I really want to know what where you stand on this De Gea situation, right? Because we've spoken about it quite a bit. And I've made my my opinion clear in a video I did on Monday. No, not that many. Well, there's plenty of comments on it. There was plenty of disagreement on it. Now, all of this, what, what I would say is, is this, right? What I would say is this. If Eric, if, if, if money wasn't an issue this summer, Eric Ten Hag would be letting De Gea leave and we'd be getting a new goalkeeper in. The reason Eric Ten Hag is doing this is because of priorities. And maybe and you'd, ha you'd have to presume that Ten Hag knows more. Well, geez, if Ten Hag doesn't know more about his budget than we do, then there's a problem. I'm presuming that's the only reason that he's signing this new contract. Uh, and and we, we've we, we've gone we've read down here. Well, it's, it's not the first time we've read it. We've read it everywhere. Look, United summer money is expected to go on their priority positions, which are a centre forward and a central midfielder. And we've we spoke. I spoke on the with the lads on the podcast plenty of times, and we're in complete agreement. Complete agreement that. A new centre forward is the biggest priority. We all agree on that. The thing that I disagree with with quite a few people is what our second biggest priority is. Now, for me, it's probably a goalkeeper. But I'm torn between saying a goalkeeper and a midfielder because, yeah, geez, even when Casemiro and Eriksen have been playing, Recently, they haven't been as good. Now, um, Jake, uh, another lad from the podcast, he, he he mentioned a good a good point yesterday that sort of resonated with me. And he said, "Look, he's, I suppose we're, we're all playing devil's advocate here. You know full well that what I do is I look to try and find the positive angle, not naively all the time, not blindly." But if De Gea is going to sign a new contract, I don't think it's the right thing for Manchester United to do. Okay, I've made my opinion clear on that. But clearly, because of financial restraints and financial budgets, Ten Hag's decided that the lesser evil here, and that's pretty much what we're looking at. There's no, no offence to David De Gea, but the lesser evil would be to keep De Gea for a little bit longer and invest in his central midfield which tells us that Ten Hag would back himself and his coaches to improve De Gea a little, a little bit more than he could improve that midfield he he probably feels there's more to work with with De Gea again I'm I'm playing devil's advocate here he probably feels there's more to work and I'm thinking look if, if Ten Hag is Improved Wan-Bissaka in the way he has. And there's so many other players this season that have improved. Then I've just got to hope now that I'm proven spectacularly wrong. And that over the course of the summer, over the course of a full another full preseason, away from the pressures of games every three days, that De Gea really can improve and switch towards that Ten Hag style. I'm guessing that's... I'm guessing that's Pretty much all we've got to hold on to there. Because I don't think he should be signing a new contract in an ideal world. But it's not exactly the ideal situation this summer, is it? New owners coming in, financial restraints, restraints, financial restraints, genuine FFP issues. There's a couple of super chats there. Let me read this out. Uh, Spence, you're saying a few weeks ago, I didn't mind the idea of stay Dave staying as a backup. After Sevilla and West Ham in particular, just think it's time for him to completely go. Thanks very much for Super Chat there, Spence. I think I've looked, I, I don't want to sort of 
jump on here this morning and just end end up being another like a slagging match against the Haya. I've made my opinion abundantly clear. Quite a few of you agree with me. Not everybody does. Or it's or it's probably more to the fact that I think we all pretty much agree on De Gea, but we don't agree on the priority order list. That's a th I think we all pretty much agree that De Gea is not going to be Manchester United's number one goalkeeper for the long term future. It's just that quite a lot of you see we all see the striker as the number one. We don't all see the mid goalkeeper as the number two. A lot of us see the midfielder as the number two. Winning 11 FC Fantasy. And I see they're rejoining as a member, dude. Uh, Bully, you're saying, Sam, age is not on United's side now. I think we look class on the field, but think of age. I don't know what that means there. Sorry, dude. Uh, there's a super chat there from Parky. Thank you very much, dude. What are you saying? Signing De Gea to a new deal and having him just sit on the bench is utterly ridiculous, even if he takes a pay cut. Now, I, again, I've done my video early this week and I said I would question, for the first time, I would question Ten Hag if... De Gea signed that new deal. And I would question Ten Hag. And by the looks of it, De Gea is signing that deal. And we're... Type... I don't, I don't know if there's anything to type there. Do you genuinely think that... If, if Man United had the money this summer to go out and sign a striker, a midfielder, and a goalkeeper, but like without without really worrying too much. Do you think Ten Hag would do it? Or do you think he would still persevere with De Gea? Because that's what we're doing here. We're persevering. We're not, we're not giving De Gea a new contract because he massively deserves one. We're definitely persevering. And I hope it I hope I hope it works. I really, really hope it works. There's another super chat there from PS. How you doing, buddy? Thank you very much. You're saying, I totally agree that a goalkeeper is a second priority after number nine, but we could get a young understudy. That's probably, I think, where we've got to be looking at now, PS, because I think, realistically, me doing a... I could do a video of potential new goalkeeper signings. I could do one on Diogo Costa. I could do one on David Rea. I could do one on, on Mike Minion for, from AC Milan. I could do it on a couple of younger goalkeepers as well. A lot of that video would kind of be pointless because I don't think that we're now... If, if De Gea does sign that contract, which it sounds like he is, it's, very, it's now very unlikely, I would say. Again, this is an opinion. It's very unlikely we would go out and sign like a proper number, like a world-class number one top goalkeeper of the level of Diogo Hosta or David Rea. We would probably sign a younger one, somebody who can sort of, somebody who wouldn't be frustrated at not playing every single week, but would have the ambition of doing so. And across the course of a season should challenge De Gea. And then if he takes his opportunity, can take De Gea out of the team. Now, for some people, that might be Dean Henderson. And we've got to have a conversation around Dean Henderson. This is from the Times. Uh, this was written last night as well. Saying that it remains possible that United will sign a goalkeeper or give Dean Henderson another try. Now, I'm actually going to put this down as a poll because I think this is definitely an interesting one. Start a poll. Would you give Dean Henderson another chance? Yes or no? Simple poll. Right, simple poll. Because I'd be really interested to know where everyone stands on this one. Prior to, was it the beginning? It was at the beginning. It was Solskjaer's final season, I think it was. When we were going into it, it was COVID. And Dean Henderson had finished the season before, kind of breaking into the first team. And you thought, okay, let's see what goes on here. De Gea got, you kind of got usurped. Going into the preseason, Dean Henderson was our first choice goalkeeper. And then Dean Henderson got COVID. And then De Gea came back in. Took the number one spot. And never looked back. Dean Henderson was pissed. And you know that, um, that interview that he did. 
Now, I, I, I don't know whether when that interview happened, I was like, there is absolutely no chance. I can see so many of you mentioning the comments down here. Catlego saying Henderson's burned his bridges. Uh, Pricer, you're saying the same one. Nathan, you're saying he's never had the talent to back up his attitude. Andrew, in the minute he gave that interview, I was done with him. But Wayne, you're saying he's a better all-round goalkeeper. Overwhelming majority of you down here are saying no. Again, when it comes to... I think... What Manchester United clearly are going to do this summer is try to make the best of a bad situation with our goalkeepers. Next season's still going to be an issue with the goalkeeper. Will it be slightly better? My God, it better be slightly better, I'll tell you that. I wish that that wasn't the case. And I'm not just looking at Edison at City and Allison at Liverpool. Although I kind of am, of just how much of a difference having the right goalkeeper can make. To it's not just about stopping goals. It's not just about passing it out from the back. It's about utter confidence that breeds through the entire team when you've got the right man behind you in goal. It changes everything. It changes the touches that the players have, the, the, the confidence that they have to to, to play back to him. It makes a... That, and that, that's, that's where we, uh, quite a few of us, disagree on the priority list. I can see there being such an incredible difference to the, the makeup of every single one of our defenders, the makeup of every single one of our midfielders by having a different goalkeeper who's that confident behind them. But it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And it must mean that Man United's budgets this summer really are an issue. Really are an issue. Because Ten Hag is, a, is an extremely um, principled and, and, and quite a stubborn man. He's shown flexibility, a lot of flexibility with David De Gea this year in Man United playing out from the back. Ten Hag has really shown some flexibility there. But Dean Henderson, I'm going to go back and have another conversation. Well, I want to finish this conversation about Dean Henderson. There's a few super chats. I want to read these out before we, before I go down there and read yours. Jibak, thank, thank you very much for sending this in, dude. You're saying if even if we want De Gea to stay for 23-24, I'd trigger his extension. Makes no sense to keep him on 200 grand a week for three years. I'd bite the bullet for a year. Well, you know, I disagree with that. Now, remember as well, by the way, that we saved, what was it? 500 grand a week? on Ronaldo and we've saved that since November because wages are a big issue and that wages are tying directly in to FFP and that's probably Jibak when you think about it that's probably why United need to get that down and cut that in half because you're looking there 200 grand a week 375 grand a week you're looking well you don't do the maths that's 175 grand a week spare that's a full-on top level player and Man United have got to with the new FFP restrictions that Revenue, was it turnover? I think it's revenue. The wages of players and staff can't exceed 70% of that revenue. In the goodness of time, it's not coming in this year. I think it drops down to 90% this year, 80% the year after, and then 70%. It's complicated. Just like everything else with Manchester United these days. It's complicated. My word. Even just thinking about it. Sam Tyler, you're saying that, well, Dean can do one. Mal, you're calling him toxic. Uh Gary, you're saying De Gea has never had decent competition to keep him on his toes. I'm guessing you forgot Sergio Romero existed because he was the best competition that we possibly had. He was a great number two. Um, Jordan, you're saying, what's going on with Costa, Young and Decent? Young, Decent and 60 mil. And there you go. That's exactly why. I'm guessing you're speaking about Diogo Costa, the goalkeeper. Uh, Benjamin, you're saying, you think De Gea breeds confidence? No, I do not. That's the issue. What I'm saying is that if we had a goalkeeper who does breathe that confidence, trust me, every single one of those defenders, their level would go up. Every single one of those midfielders, their, their level would go up. And you saw it. For me, the, the, the clearest example of that was the West Ham mistake. Because as soon as that happened, everybody's confidence just went psh, snapped in half. And everything was difficult after that point. 
every single pass, ball, everything became a struggle after that point. Um, Samyak, thank you very much for sending this in, dude. What are you saying? We have to sign a new goalkeeper. As Ten Hag's style build up, the build up of Ten Hag can only work with the goalkeeper who can play out with his feet. It's critical to the shape of the team. I think it's as crucial as a striker, maybe Dean or anyone else. Now, Dean is somebody who definitely has more command of his box, right? When it comes to taking crosses, he's going to be better at De Gea than that. When it comes to being a sweeper keeper, he's going to be better than that. I don't actually know the stats behind De Dean Henderson's ability to be that playmaking goalkeeper, but he's certainly got more, more command of his box, which is one of De Gea's problems in, unto itself. Um, Sigmund talking about, look how confident Madrid were last night. Mate, yeah, whoa. What a game of footy that was. The levels of that. You're thinking, <laughs> we are some way off. We are some way off. Right when, right when Vinicius banged that goal in, I, I, was, I was celebrating. I was enjoying that. And I was hoping it was going to end more than one. But it ended up one. It was a ridiculously good goal by De Bruyne as well. Alex, thank you for the super chat, dude. What are you saying? Even if you put questionable attitude aside, can Henderson play out from the back better than De Gea? If yes, then he should prove he's good enough in preseason. I'm going to have to uh, take a closer look, inspection at uh, Dean Henderson's numbers at Forest this season prior to his injury before Kieran Aves came in. Because as I said, one thing he's very good at compar compared to De Gea, naturally, is how commanding he is in his box and how he can act to that sweeper keeper. But I don't know about his passing out from the back stats. Um, and you're saying attitude and mentality have been a huge question at the club. Can we afford to bring in a problem like Henderson? And I know you're they're spreading the rumors about him being the dressing room elite, but they've they've only ever been rumors. And I try and, and avoid assumptions here on this channel. You know that. He may well have been the leak. Rio Ferdinand, what may have been the leak back under Moyes. We don't know who they were. All right. We can all assume because we've read it somewhere, but it's all assumptions. Um Chris, what are you saying? Do thank you very much for Super Chat, man. What are you saying? The Hayer extension is good, so we can set him next year instead of a free agent by a young goalkeeper. That's the sort of thing that Ed Woodward would say, isn't it? You know, protect the, the protect the value of your asset, give them a longer contract, and then I think it's just that the as United fans, we've all been burned by um, all these players that we've given long contracts to that we then can't bloody sell. Martial being a very good example of that. Uh, Phil Jones. Jesse Lingard was, was a tough one. I mean, even Alex Tellers was on a big, big old wedge of cash. Eric Bailly, too. I think, geez, man. Jeez. Um, Abinav saying that the, the Henderson's interview wasn't an assumption. No, that was where I massively questioned. I mean, self-confidence is, uh, is, a, is a good asset for a professional athlete. If you can back it up. Uh, I, th I do think he's definitely got a heightened sense of self-importance. Um, but again, well, actually, no, just I don't. Everywhere I look with this whole goalkeeper situation, I just see compromises. I think what Ten Hag is doing here is compromising. Of course, I, I'm only again. I suppose this is speculation. I'm only speculating that Ten Hag doesn't really want De Gea there. I don't think Ten Hag can look at this season, look at De Gea and go, you know what? I've got no problems in, in the goalkeeping department. Zero problems at all. Like, you know that Ten Hag's not saying that. You know that that's just not the case. But really, budgets must be an issue at United this year, which which is probably... A reason to be worried about what's going to be coming in the summer transfer window because we all want that striker. I think we'll have we'll have the money for the striker. It's not going to be an issue, but we've got to sell properly. But when it comes to the midfielder, we we Maguire, Martial, McTominay, Tellez, Jones, Swanzebe, Williams, Bay. There's eight. There's probably more. We have to sell well this summer because I think selling is how we are going to finance that midfielder. And we don't know we don't know what budget we're talking about with this midfielder either. Are we talking about someone who's going to come in and be like a 20 million understudy to Ericsson or somebody who's more in the 50, 60, 70 million mark like Caicedo who could come in and really establish himself in our starting 11? We don't know the level 
of that midfielder. We know the level that the striker is going to be is a world-class one. I would probably argue we need a second striker. Certainly if we're going to be getting Vekors leaving, which he should be, and Martial, which I think we should be selling. And you're saying rather win a game 4-3 than win every game 4-3 than 0-0. Well, I think everybody would rather you win a game 4-3 than draw 0-0. I know what you're trying to get out of there, but you spectacularly got that one wrong. <laughs> Um, Emma and, Emma and worse and we have gone from the richest club in the world to falling down behind Europe's elite because we pay over the top for salaries and transfers yeah well that's something we've been doing for a long ass time Chris Beadle is getting bored he's getting bored of the actual big talking point about Man United signing De Gea to a new I, I'm sorry mate I, let me just make some stories up out of thin air no I'm going to focus on the biggest talking point that is, is around I'm sorry mate if you don't want to Joining the chat? Well, there you go. You can always pop on. But anyway, it, is, it was the right time to move on. Anyway, I just fancy calling you out. This is something that we've spoken about already. I'm sorry if you're going to get bored because we're speaking about our misfiring forwards. But this isn't about our misfiring forwards. It's actually about our misfiring wingers. Because if you look here about... Matt, We spoke about this earlier this week, about Manchester United's chance creation. Right, and you look at Rashford with his Rashford's the only one with a positive XG. But this is some da some data that I found on Reddit that I found very very interesting. On the bottom here, you can see the expected assists. The higher a number, the better. There you go. And up here, you've got the total amount of chances that have been made by these players. Right, again, higher up the left act the, this axis. I can't remember it was X and Y. Is it X on the bottom, Y on the top? I think that's what it is. Higher up this axis. Access, access, the more chances they've made. The higher up that one, the more expected assists they've got. So you can see here, James Madison, absolutely. Let's try, let's get this bad boy up. Uh, is that one there? James Madison, extremely, extremely impressive. It's no surprise to see Saka and Martinelli both being that high up the list. But look at Manchester United's down here. Look at that, man. Everyone talk. Everyone shouts and screams at um, how bad how bad Val Veghorst is. Martial is equally as ineffective when it comes to chance creation um, for his teammates. But look here, Anthony, that far down. Sancho, that far down. Rashford, that far down. Manchester United's wingers really are massively ineffective at creating opportunities. Bruno Fernandes, by the way, his expected assists don't even fit on this chart. He's, he's got like 14, 15 expected assists. But look how look 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 at that. Look at all all of Man United's players down there. It's um I know that a new, I know that a striker is a big issue. But my word, do our wingers need to start producing more for them as well at the, at the exact same time? You can let me know what you think about that. I'm going to go over here because I can see. <laughs> oh, man, he has done it. Ah, oh, JVD, man. You are an absolute hero. An absolute legend. Still haven't managed to break it. But you, sir, with 50 gifted memberships, man, thank you so much. It's always it, and I say it every time because it's true every single time. It's the greatest compliment anybody could ever possibly give me and United People's TV that they are willing to dig into their own pocket to bring other people in, to welcome people into the community. There's 50 of you now. Make sure you go over to the community tab on YouTube. Join the Telegram community. Go into the members only. What I'm happy to announce here, by the way, and I'm definitely following through with this. I've been a long time thinking about it. And I'm going to bring the arms back this weekend. All right. I'm going to bring the arms back. Previously, the way that we did the arms was an hour before the game. And we spoke for an hour about the upcoming game. I'm going to do a similar thing. It's going to be members only. Um, and it's going to be me just chatting to you for half an hour just before the game. You can have your you, you can have your, your opinions on, on, the, on the game that's coming up. Because I thought... What would be the best time to do the arms again? And it would be before a game because that's when everybody tunes in from all around because there's so many different time zones 
I thought it would kind of be unfair if you just choose a random one. So what I'm going to do is bring the arms back before the game. Probably only cut it down to half an hour. It's going to be a lot more informal. It's just going to be us just chatting. All right. So big up to every single one of you. Big up to JVD, an absolute hero of the channel. And just big up to like, look at that. Ray, man, you've joined in as well. Ledge, gifted five memberships, man. What? I love this community. That's why I'm bringing the arms back, man. I should never have stopped the arms, but I was just a bit busy. But the arms is coming back. All right. And it's going to be coming back for members only. I'll figure out the logistics of it and where we do it. We might just do it inside the Telegram chat. We might do it with a, like a private YouTube video. I'll figure that one out. All right. But the arms is coming back. We'll keep it to half an hour before each game. And I'll give you all some details about that before. Nathan's saying, why is it called the arms? I don't know. Just it felt like just the arms is like, I don't know. It's like the name of a traditional pub. So call it the arms. Where is it? Is it, is it still down there? No, it's not there. It's not there. I'll bring it up later. But yeah, the arms are coming back, baby. <laughs> David, stay on topic, Sam. How dare you get distracted? Yeah, back to what I was saying there. Thank you very much. I genuinely think this is a, this is a cause for concern. Because we, see, we keep saying, ah, oh, get a world-class striker and it will solve the problems. Because yeah, Bruno creating chances left, right and centre. That person will score goals. But... Every single player has got to up their levels. Anthony has to start creating more. Sancho has to start creating more. Can't just be looking at Bruno Fernandes for creating chances. As great as he is, we need others doing it too. All right? So that's what I mean. It's a team collective issue. And I found that one quite interesting. Martial there being equally as ineffective. It's actually, well, no, pretty much, he's actually created less chances than, than Vekos, but he's created slightly better chances. Hence, why is expected assist is going up? That's got to be improved, right? That's got to be improved. Uh, Kasoko, uh, you're there asking, um, da, 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 how do you become a member? I'm sure somebody can let you know in the comments below. Lee P saying it's good. It's got to be the people's arms. I can't remember. What, I think it was just called the arms. Was it called? Was it called the Sunny Arms? I think it was just called the arms. Where is it? I think it's called the United Arms. You want to, you, got, you got me looking now. You got me looking back at my art, <laughs> my artwork for it. Let me quickly find it. United People's TV. United Legacy Arms. There we go. There she is. Little nod. No Garnacho on the list. Actually, that's a good point there. Where is Garnacho on that list? Garnacho on that list. Let's see Welbeck, Watkins, Kulusevski. No. No, I can't see Garnacho on that list. Don't know. Uh, and you're saying the chance creation would surely be affected by the lack of quality options up front. Yeah, it all it all, it all ties into each other, of course. Yes. But our wingers have to up their levels. It's not just about signing a, a, a wonderful world-class centre forward and all of our problems being solved next year. That's what I think so. Jibak, you're saying, any chance you do an overlap-style pod episode? Well, what do you mean with that? Sort of inviting loads of other people in, what, doing it live and direct? I mean, they're doing that because they've they've got a massive studio. They've got about six cameramen. They've got about four producers. <laughs> That's a big old undertaking. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. Jay Shaw, what are you saying? Thank you very much for the Super Chat, dude. You're saying, Sam, do you think the red cards Casemiro had received has made him being decisive in games going into tackles. Seems like he's scared of getting booked. Jay Shaw, that was I think that was mentioned on the podcast this week. He he definitely um, the game that he had and that he crafted in La Liga doesn't work in the Premier League. I think you know because he was always considered that per that incredible player who was so good at fouling without getting a yellow card for ages. Um, that doesn't quite work in the Premier League. You don't get as much uh, leeway. Now that it shouldn't have been a red card with that sort of like when he grabbed what's this called? That dude, bond dude from Crystal Palace. Can't remember his name. Will Hughes. That was it. That wasn't a red card. Even the other one was soft. However. I don't know whether it's um I don't know whether it's him being nervous. But last four games, for example, the only game I'm gonna say where he played well was probably the first half against Villa. 
at home. Other than that, I'm looking at Casemiro and going, what's going on? Start of the season, shaky. Then he had like two to three months of brilliance and that coincided with Manchester United's best football post-World Cup when we won the League Cup, beat Barcelona. That was the peak of our season. He really is, at this moment in time, he's just, uh, I don't know, he just looks deflated. Looks a bit deflated. Speaking of deflated, United's fan base. We're all sitting here frustrated and waiting and waiting and waiting. Now, yesterday I did a video. Oh, crap, I've got an interview in six minutes. Oi! There you go. Let's let's wrap through this. I forgot that I had that today. I'll tell you what it is in a second. Um, I did a video yesterday where I objectively put the two bids alongside each other. Sheikh Jassim and the 9-2 Foundation. Jim Ratcliffe and the Ineos bid. And I looked at the pros and the cons of both. Now, the one thing I want to say here, which I think just, just cannot be said, you can't, I mean, you, can, you can, who am I kidding? You can, you can have your own opinion, right? You can absolutely have your own opinion. But this is the thing for me. I don't look at either of these bids and say, yep, I'm absolutely going for that one. That's 100% the best bid. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that bid. That's what, there are, there are genuinely pros and genuinely cons of both. And it depends which one you want to latch onto. And which cons you're willing to sort of go, eh, all right, and sort of brush to one side because they both have them. And that's why I wanted to do that video because I think it's kind of unfair to sort of slam it. It's just I can't I can't wait for this to all be done. And my interview today, I'm going to be having in four minutes now, <laughs> is uh, with a French football journalist. And we're going to be speaking about the Jim Ratcliffe ownership of Nice. Because I've already done my research video into it. But he'll be able to tell me some more information. I'm going to speak about what do the fans think? What's been the reaction? Have they been ambitious? What did they do initially? Um, what have been the big, biggest success stories? What have been the biggest failures? Uh, what about Dave Brailsford? What's he done there? Uh, what's what are the murmurs going around Nice about dual ownership? Because surely they're going to be pissed if Ineos would then buy Manchester United. These are the questions I'm going to be speaking to him about. And that video will be going out at lunchtime today. I'm hoping to also then have a, an interview where I discuss the same thing from uh, a PSG perspective. Because although PSG are owned by, by obviously the Qatari state, and if Sheikh Justine was successful at Manchester United, it will be private. It would be foolish of us to think that there wouldn't be lessons learned and they wouldn't be looking at the PSG ownership and saying, OK, well, that went right or that went wrong. They will be learning from that. So I think there are things that we can learn from that as well. And that's why I want to speak to him, too. So I, I think it should be an insightful interview. This is the first week we've got without a game. And it's an opportunity, genuine chance for us to actually, you know what? Take a step back and try and get the sort of knowledge that we all need. We're all desperate for, really. And that's why I'm doing it. Melanie, thank you so much for joining there uh, as a member. Nice to see you there. But look, I'm going to wrap this one up so I don't get, so I'm not late for the, the second time <laughs> in 45 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining in. Thank you so much to JVD, by the way. Thank you to everybody who sent in your super chats. Uh, Jay Shaw, you sent one in. Lots and it all disappeared, so I can't actually see who it was. Uh, Ray, you gifted memberships. You're all absolute heroes, man. I love this community. I really, really do. The arms is coming back this weekend. Uh, I'm probably going to bring that. I'll figure out the time, but I imagine, I imagine just like 20 minutes before the game kicks off, something like that. I'll I'll figure it out and I'll let you know in the Telegram chat. I'm going to go have this interview. You're going to watch it around about lunchtime. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>